Well, welcome and congratulations to both of you for being this year's recipients of the Sage Casbis Award. Uh, as you may or may not know, part of the tradition of the celebration today is that uh, we sit down with those who have received the award for an interview and a chat about social and behavioral science research. And I'm thrilled to have that opportunity today, so thank you for being here. Good to be with you. Thank you. It's wonderful to be with you. The first question today is about the issue of history and equity in the United States, not equality. Both of you come at it through different lenses, different experiences, and obviously different types of research. We were hoping that you could think about this issue, and could you give us a grade for the U.S. right now, a report card, if you will. How do you think the, uh, the U.S. is doing in terms of history and equity at this point in time? So, Dr. Nelson, let me start with you. Gosh, that's a hard question. Yes. I think um, rather than a grade, I have in mind a kind of undulating, um, you know, sort of spectrum or something which the grade goes up and down. Um, I think, you know, certainly there was a time both in research and as just, you know, people, you know, members of the public, I think we thought we were on this, um, uh, you know, inevitable sort of cresting of progress. So we would always be sort of advancing equity and sort of making progress. And I think we've seen we've kind of gone back and forth. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, in the last year, of course, we've seen the Supreme Court decision on Roe v. Wade. And so depending on one's perspective, you know, I think, you know, that's probably an F for women's bodily autonomy um, uh, and equity with regards to gender equity. Um, we've also seen some rolling back of um, the promises of affirmative action. Um, as a way to redress sort of historic discrimination, so that the long, the long sort of you know the sort of the attempt to sort of um, bring equity in the in the space of um, uh, of, of race and racial equity. Um, so you know that's probably a D or a C. Um, so, uh, but there are other you know you could look at other I think markers. Um, that show that we're making some progress. So, you know, I, I worked recently in the Biden-Harris administration, and a lot of that work was about advancing equity and really taking seriously the fact that there had been um, historic barriers to certain communities, including rural communities and uh, um, racialized and marginalized communities sort of getting ahead. And so I think there are policies and programs that are actively trying to redress that. So I think it's, you know, this is a long-winded answer as um, academics are, are, uh, are want to give um, a blaze, but I think we're, you know, we're on a spectrum from sort of B to F, I think, depending on, on, on what you ask. And I wouldn't give an A just because I think we should always be sort of advancing towards, um, you know, higher ideals. Always striving for more. Yep, absolutely. More and better. Absolutely. Dr. Anderson. I'm very much with Alondra and thinking more in terms of trajectories. Okay. than in fixed points. Uh, in primary school grading scales, there's a grade that's called needs improvement. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where I stand. I'm very worried about the recent trajectory of the United States because we're seeing a lot of democratic backsliding, backlash against women's rights, against mm -hmm. racial justice, against justice for people of alternative genders and sexualities. But at the same time, I also see, like Alondra, that there's movements in the other direction. And I still have a basic optimism about the United States. I think we can pull through this. Uh, and I think that, in a way, is a kind of American attitude. Hmm. Um, and so we have to roll up our sleeves and get working. Well, that's a uh, perfect segue to my next question, which I said here is the hard part. How do we follow up if we use the analogy with primary, primary school? Right? In some years, a student will do better than in other years. What can we do in a future era or in future years to make the U.S. or help the U.S. become better or improve their grades, if you will? Well, I'm not the John Dewey professor for nothing. <laughs> I go back to John Dewey, and his argument is deepening democracy. Mm -hmm. Getting people together, ordinary citizens, talking civilly about the problems of the day in all of the diversity of our perspectives is absolutely critical 
And what we found is that when you get ordinary people together and get the trolls and the grandstanders under control, ordinary citizens can learn that we have a lot in common and that there are no demons and can learn to build solutions together. Excellent. Um, you know, I think we need uh, the political will to do it. And I think that really requires engaging people who feel dispossessed and not part mm -hmm. of the political community. That's the United States um, uh, to be engaged in the work. I mean, we have, we're in a period now where there's a lot of data on low trust in institutions, a lot of data on low trust in government. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, we need, you know, we're losing um, the sort of glue that holds us together. Um, and uh, often it was institutions that did that. And, and that, you know, that is even sort of um, uh, becoming less tenable than it used to be. And so, um, yeah, I think, you know, Elizabeth responded about democracy. I think that's right. And I would just add, um, uh, you know, there's a, a, a sociology colleague, Francesca Paletta, who has a book that's called Democracy is an Endless Meeting. And I think, you know, it, it is a, it, it's both democracy as the ideal and democracy as the process um, and, and really engaging, being willing to engage and to appreciate that even in a representative democracy that people should have a uh, voice and, and say um, and be engaged in the work of, of living together. Dr. Anderson, the next question is for you. Your pathway to social science and behavioral science research was via philosophy. So can you share your view? How do you think that has changed your perspective, helped your perspective, uh, impacted your research? Well, a big theme in my research is that the social sciences are presupposing values all the time. And in fact, they wouldn't be interesting to us if they weren't concerned with things that ordinary people mm -hmm. are concerned with. And consequently, to conduct the social sciences responsibly, they have to be engaged in moral and political reflection. And then mm -hmm. on the philosophy side, my top priority is to make philosophers more empirically responsible. You can't just spin out solutions or ethical ideas out of your head. You have to engage the full range of the social sciences to be able to think clearly and responsibly about moral and political issues. So really my whole career has been dedicated to bringing these, the social sciences and philosophy together because when we work together, we produce better work. So would you say that some of those silos are breaking down a bit? Absolutely. Yeah. So at University of Michigan, I designed and, and was the first director of our philosophy, politics, and economics program. And PPE programs have been flourishing across the country. And I take that to be a model of, of education. And, you know, if you look at young people, they are going after all kinds of interdisciplinary majors that are bridging the social sciences and the humanities. They're excited about that. And that's one of the reasons why I'm optimistic for the future of this country, because there is this groundswell of innovation uh, going on at university level that we can really uh, build on. And as we talked about before the interview started, my son just graduated from University of Michigan in PP. So yeah, congratulations. <laughs> yeah, thank you. What would you say about sil silos in social science research? I think that we are very much realizing that we've got these big grand challenges, um, that we've got some really big issues. And I think in the social sciences with a sense of humility, having to face the reality that we've been posing questions about inequality, about poverty, about you know, failed educational outcomes, for example, in schools for a very long time, um, and that we've not been so good at answering them. You know, we've been, I think, perhaps too captivated with our own, um, I think, burrowing down into smaller and smaller mechanisms, which I think are, which are important, um, than really, I think, sort of looking up 
from the breadth of the information that we have for, you know, and if you think about educational equality from Dewey to the present, um, you know, we know quite a lot about, about why there's educational inequality and you don't need, um, you know, another experiment, social experiment, natural experiment to tell us why. Um, and, you know, I think that we need to be working together across fields and across these silos to, um, and, and also across sectors, so working with people in policy and civil society um, to really uh, affect change. So I think there's a great appetite. We've, we're seeing um, the kind of reconfiguration of universities and colleges around thematics, you know, data, climate, um, inequality, uh, that, that really sort of bring together and break down these silos across different um, disciplines and, and really appreciate that while it's great to have that single authored article or book from that single genius, um, it's also the case that we can do great work together in collaboration um, often across um, disciplines. So I think you know we can ex need to accelerate that, but I think that that general trend I think is happening and that people very much appreciate that it's increasingly appreciated among scholars that it's necessary. So we're seeing progress. Some progress, yeah. Speaking of silos, you spent some time in Washington, D.C. recently <laughs> in the, uh, the Biden-Harris administration. Uh, you were the senior science advisor to the President of the United States. Did you see or experience uh, research having an impact on policy decisions in your time uh, in the administration? Yes, so research was actually central to the work that I did. So um, uh, I was in the leadership of the Office of Science and Technology Policy, which does a lot of work on science and technology as we think about it, you know, as you think about it at the top of your mind. But a lot of the work of, of OSTP, as it's called, is about the U.S. research ecosystem. So it's about thinking about federal investments in the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health. Um, and what should we invest in and how should we think about that? It's also a thinking about how do we make sure that um, research fields that the government are investing in are representative, that, they, you know, they're, that they're representative of a lot of ways, that we're not just funding endeavors and researchers on the coasts, um, that we're looking at rural communities, native and tribal communities, for example, historically black colleges and universities, and also that the work of government and government investments should be um, about all of us, right, so that there should be opportunities for the broad swath of us. So, um, and that was just, that's in the research space. I would also say, you know, coming into government, um, I'd go back to the sort of low trust in government and low trust in, in science. There had been um, some real violations of scientific integrity um, uh, in recent years. And so some of the work that we did beginning in the first week, I was um, in a first day um, appointee in the Biden administration, was around um, kind of restoring scientific integrity and creating policies um, to make it the case that if they're going to do something called evidence-based policy making, which we can um, talk a little bit more about, which but which in part tries to take up social science research into the decision making across the federal government, how do you do that um, in a way that ensures that there's not political sort of incursions into the the sort of knowledge base that you're using or the evidence base? So that was very much um, a part of the work in this sort of sense that. Governance and science, I mean, this goes back, um, you know, to some of the, the sort of early classical social science work on, on sort of science and governments and science in the state um, uh, are, are necessary and sort of, um, sort of inter interpenetrating. Um, and, uh, and so the science piece was, was really very much about um, research, whether the topic was on fusion energy or whether it was on, um, you know, workforce issues, um, the work of social and behavioral sciences was really quite key to it. Thank you. I think anybody watching this video would be very disappointed in me if I didn't ask you what it feels like to walk into the Oval Office the first time. Can you tell us what that's like? Oh, goodness. It's both bigger and smaller than you expect. I mean, okay. so I think it's probably... Um, maybe just a little bit bigger than this room. Okay. Um, so it's small in size, um, but it's big in symbolism, you know, so. Um, uh, and the, the ceilings are very high. It's a very grand place. Um, and it could also be a warm place. I mean, there's, you know, yeah. So it's, um, I, I would also say, um, if you're going into that office, you're going in to probably do a briefing of the president, mm -hmm. um, and that is horrifying <laughs> in its own way. <laughs> Um, because uh, uh, President Biden is notoriously um, uh, asks quite a lot of questions and like um, is uh, prides himself on sort of 
um, being able to ask more questions than his aides can possibly answer. So, you know, you get yourself ready to answer all the questions, and he just goes and goes and goes. So. Well, congratulations again on the appointment. It was wonderful for the social sciences. Thank you. It really, really was. Back to the question, Dr. Anderson, what do you think, from your perspective, what do you think we could do to strengthen the ties between research and policy? I do think that higher education plays an important role in this, in making sure that people are fully educated in a well-rounded mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. I think engineers should be studying the social sciences and the humanities, and to the extent possible, people in the social sciences and the humanities should at least be dipping their toes mm -hmm. into technological issues. Absolutely. So um, one of the things that we did in the Biden-Harris administration was to reestablish the um, Social and Behavioral Sciences Subcommittee as part of this a body called the National Science and Technology Council, um, which had been disbanded. And that really brought together social and behavioral scientists working across government and every agency you could possibly imagine from the Department of the Interior to the EPA and everything in between to really talk about the craft of research and how they were doing research and evidence in their work. Um, and so really continuing from the Obama administration, social and behavioral science really does sit in the middle of policymaking and government in quite a profound way that's really important. I think one of the things that, was, that I learned um, as a social scientist going into government was the importance of the work of translation. So our colleagues in um, and biomedical research have translation institutes or centers, so they're, they're very sort of actively have created a whole tier of institutions that are about translation. And I think one thing the social sciences could do better is actively sort of create that bridge between research and policy in this sort of space of translation that could be built out. And then the other thing that was quite interesting was that, um, was that things that we don't, I think value as much as we should, things like meta-analyses are really important for government. So a really good review essay, a really fantastic meta-analysis of you know, 100 or 500 different papers on a particular behavioral science question uh, are incredibly valuable for policymakers. Great, thank you. That's all the time that we have for today. Thank you both very much for traveling the distance. Uh, to attend this event today on a beautiful fall day in Palo Alto. It's been really enjoyable. I did sit on the selection committees. Uh, it was a very challenging and daunting task, but ultimately it seemed to be a very, very easy selection. I'm thrilled to have been part of it and to have selected both of you this year to be Sage Casbis Award winners. It's a great honor, thank great. you. Great, thank you. It's a it's tremendous great. honor, deeply grateful. I'm glad to have this great company and um, want to say hello to Sarah Miller-McCune. Thank you. Mm -hmm.